Good evening, everybody, and welcome to <coughs> lecture number five out of six. As you see, the title, this is the uh, three weeks uh, series in the year 2023. So the lecture title is Dancing on Eggs While Holding Back the Flood, about the, uh, the court Jews in medieval Spain. And as you can see, tonight is being two sponsors. <coughs> One is the Shellers, in honor of this young lady over here, <laughs> Rob Rosenfeld. Very nice. And the other one is by the Robbins, uh, in my honor. And thank you, everybody, for the sponsorships. And after tonight, there's one more to go. And that's how it goes. After tonight, one more to go. <clears throat> tonight, as you can see, we're going to be dealing with a very different figure that most of you probably never heard of. And that, of course, is uh, Abraham Benvenisti, who uh, is, as I said before, not so well known, except you know among the specialists and that sort of thing. Very interesting figure, <coughs> especially in the context of what I'm trying to convey over here, because why am I doing this during the three weeks? Here you had the Jews living in difficult situations. The only way they could you know, operate was through, through these high-level lobbyists, for better or worse, and being that this is the nine days, we all know in the end it didn't work. You know, I mean, it worked for a while, but then it didn't work. So we're going chronological order. Tonight we deal with a different type of court Jew. Not the sordid type, okay? Not that type. On the other hand, not a Superman like Kostai Kreskis, that we spoke who is a rare bird indeed. I mean, you don't find too many people like that. Tonight, we move back from Aragon to Castile. Remember the two kingdoms? <clears throat> Aragon being on the right and Castile being the center of Spain. In the terrible years of 1391 <clears throat> to 1421, approximately, the terrible 30 years, when the terrible pogroms of the summer of 1391 were followed up <clears throat> by years and years of ferocious verbal violence, from which time to time, crowds spilled into physical violence. Okay? So there's no such thing as, you know, the FCC and all the rest of it. It was uh, pretty bad, and... These people who carried on these extremely violent rhetoric against the Jews are saints. I'm serious, you understand? They're saints in the Catholic Church, like Vincent Ferrer and others. I mean, you go to Spain, they'll show you the church where he preached. Depending on what the tour group is, they won't tell you what he said. <laughs> but, you know, but in other words, it's a, these are famous uh, people. So as a result, if you lived in the 1390s, early 1400s, life was a nightmare. <clears throat> That's what I'm talking about. From our perspective today, 1391 was the beginning of a project launched by a certain lousy group aimed at eradicating the Jewish presence in Spain. It took a century, but it worked. It triumphed ultimately. Because obviously, after 1492, there's no Jewish presence left in Spain, not of professing Jews. So these guys wanted that. It just took them a little while. But 1391 to 1492 is 100 years, <clears throat> okay? And they got it done legally and, and all that. So they did win. Now, it's not in the Hitler sense of physically killing racially everybody who's Jewish. On the contrary, <clears throat> tons of Jews <clears throat> remained in Spain, but as Catholics, which is why everybody knows if you go to Spain and Portugal today, there's a lot of people have Jewish blood of one form or another doesn't mean anything, you understand? If you run across somebody <clears throat> who says, we have a funny tradition of uh, you know, lighting a candle on Friday night, that don't mean anything because they're 100% Catholics. They just have a funny little thing. You yourselves might have parents that come from Europe or something like that. You might have some little superstition over there also. You know, um, We have our share. It doesn't affect their fundamental identity. They're not Jewish, okay? And they don't identify as Jewish at all. At all. Uh, although, as we shall see today, and I can't go into deep into Spanish history because we're just doing a little series on the court Jews, but it's against the background. Interestingly, for the first time in history, in the 15th century, which is what we're dealing with, the 1400s, racialism, racism, will come into play for the first time. Okay? Uh, after the, so many Jews convert, you can't oppose the person because he's Jewish, because now he's a Catholic. But he's still very Jewy, you see? 
and different. You can't stand these guys when they hang around and they yak at the corners or they take over your business or something like that. And so you're against Jews by race. You understand? Against Jews by race. Now to the specifics. One of the big problems in the kingdom of Castile, <coughs> which affected the Jews certainly as, as well as the non-Jews, <coughs> was the problem that the throne was not occupied by stable monarchs. First, you had that bloody civil war we talked about where Pedro the Cruel fought Henry the Bastard and there was a lot of killing back and forth and a breakdown of law and order is gonna go along with that. And then Henry killed Pedro, but then Henry died rather young, leaving his successor young and inexperienced as we saw two lectures ago because there was a young, inexperienced king at the time of the 1391 um, uh, pogroms, so you know, there was nobody to, to make law and order, okay? There's nobody to make law and order. And therefore, the Jews are always the ones that suffer primarily when there's a breakdown of law and order. That's something you see from Spain and elsewhere. I'll say what I just said again. Wherever the Jews have lived throughout their history, the number one thing they need is law and order. Democracy is nice, and you know, liberty and liberalism is nice, but you can live without them. You cannot live as a helpless minority without law and order, right? Because I mean, they'll just tear you apart. That, that's the way the world works. Uh, so then, as we said before, you had Henry, and then King John the first died at the age of 32. So all these guys didn't live long. And he died the year before the riots broke out, leaving his 11-year-old son, Henry III, as his successor in 1390. So you see what I'm saying? It's one guy quickly followed by another, and they never quite make it to adulthood not seriously, in order to establish a, a, a long-lasting, stable reign. The theory behind monarchy is you have one person in charge for 40 years, okay? So there's a plus and a minus to that. The plus, though, is if the guy knows what he's doing or the lady knows what she's doing, so then you have a stable government, you see? Obviously, if not, not. But if you have musical chairs, that every few years someone else is coming aboard, and it takes them young and it takes them a while to learn the ropes and all the rest of it, ain't good for the Jews. That's the point. So you had Henry the Bastard and then his son, Henry III, uh, and none of these guys lived very long. So that means that there was a weak and unstable regency which correctly encouraged the pogromists in 1391. In other words, when all these riots came out and they physically attacked and killed the Jews and stuff like that, as I told you the other day, the government was against it. It was breaking law and order. The police tried to oppose it. Even the bishops of the Catholic Church tried to oppose it. It didn't matter, you see? Because people knew there's no king, really. It's a kid. It's a regency. They're not going to get themselves in hot water for a bunch of Jews. And so we can get away with it. By 1393, two years after the pogroms, this young king, Henry III, who was 14 years old, started asserting himself, and he actually proved to be a strong king at a young age, which was good for the Jews. So that means that in 1391 was all the pogroms, 1392 was all the Farrakhan stuff. By 1393, looks like a king is taking over and is going to be able to impose basic security and law and order. But then he died in 1406 at the age of 27. So he was active as a king from 14 to the age of, 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 of 27 when he died. You see what I'm saying? It's a very unstable situation, leaving behind a one-year-old baby, okay, who became King John II of Castile, who reigned for 50 years, long time. Well, not really. That's from the time he's born, pretty much. You see? Pretty much. So this is our story today going to take place during his time, the first 50 years of the 15th century. Okay, uh, this is the king we'll be dealing with tonight in connection with the next court Jew, Abraham ben Venisti. Now, in the short run, a baby as king was terrible for the Jews. And the first decade of the regency, from 1406 to 1417, when he's just growing up, were disastrous because there was no royal pushback to the anti-Semitism of the parliament, what they call the Cortes. You understand? So as you can see on the map, on the page, 
The mother was the English a princess, Catherine of, of Lancaster, uh, or the Spanish called her Catherine the Fatso. And, she, and England, England was uh, very anti-Semitic. Uh, in fact, in the Middle Ages, England was probably the most anti-Semitic country, which is why the English were the first to expel the Jews. Long before, 200 years before the Spanish. In England, they kicked the Jews out in 1290, and that was the culmination of a, big, a great deal of anti-Semitic persecution. The first of the blood libels was in England, for example. People just don't understand that. Now, today it's different, but I'm talking about then, okay? Edward I. So the fact that she, the mother was from England, Catherine, or, uh, or Catalina, as they called her, uh, so she's the great-great-grandmother of Henry VIII's wife, Catherine of Aragon, get it? You know? But anyway, um, so let's put it this way. The Jews had nobody to look to to protection. They're exposed to the mob in the sense of legislation. The parties in the parliament, in the Cortes, were the anti-Semitic ones. And therefore, in 1412, they passed these Nuremberg laws, <clears throat> okay, which are very similar to what Hitler did. Uh, Jews have to wear a special badge. They're not allowed to go in 99% of the professions. If whatever you were doing until now, you're, you're cut off. You have to sell your house within eight days and move to a, a ghetto. Um, I mean, you know, all kind of crazy things. The idea being that the average family is like this. I'm a convert. I don't need this junk. And it did work like a charm. Now, I can understand why. You see? So when we say uh, that in 1391, half the Jews converted, it's not exactly true. What they mean is in the years of 1391 to 1421, you know, in that Kufa, the original trouble started with the riots, and there were plenty of Jews that were caught in that and, and forced to convert in, in the context of the riots. But there were a lot more who, over the next years, when they were hit with one blow after another, just said, I'm out of here, I'm quitting, I'm going to become a Catholic, you know, and, and, and all this trouble. So, uh, yeah, this is one of those things where people use, historians use uh, generalities. Uh, so this is pretty bad. As a result, the Jews in Castile were hit with, uh, with, with three disasters. First of all, you had Farrakhan on steroids. You had these guys like Vincent Ferrer and Raymond Lull and the others going all over the place, making these extremely violent anti-Jewish speeches, which of course got the crowd and the church all riled up, and they're gonna kill the Jews. And you know, it, you can smell it in the air that within a few hours is coming a riot, and therefore the Jew rushes right away and says, I'm gonna convert now, and, you know, spare me. You see, spare me and my family. That's number one. Uh, number two, you pass these Nuremberg laws that I just described. Uh, I mean, they really were tough. You know, you, you cannot engage in any kind of business and so forth. And finally, uh, the Jews fell prey to international Catholic politics because at this particular time, there was a machlikas in the Catholic Church, so who should be the pope? They had two popes, right? It's too complicated to explain, but you had two people claiming to be pope at the same time. As you can see, the Europe was divided. Some followed this pope and some followed that pope. You see that? Uh, and each one called the other guy the anti-pope. And uh, it's a complicated story. It started with the king of France kidnapping the pope and then moving to Avignon and then moved back. And then it's just too much to, to explain. Suffice it to say, there was a Spaniard, Benedict, this guy, okay? And he was a Spanish and he was the pope. At least he claimed to be the pope of everybody. And the others didn't recognize him. And so he's spending half his time trying to get recognized by the other countries. And so was his opposition, okay? And uh, uh, by the way, his closest advisor, one of the closest advisor, was a very famous Mishumid, okay? Who had been a rabbi, perhaps, and now called himself Geronimo de Santa Fe, Jerome of the Holy Faith, or as the Jews called him, Megadef, you know, Megadef, which is blasphemer. But this is his close advisor, and one of the ideas he came up for a shtick to get good PR is to compel the Jews in Aragon and elsewhere, up here in Tortosa, where I'm, let me see, where I'm, it's, it's near Barcelona. Can I, does this work? Yeah, it's around there, all the way up north uh, east. 
in Tortosa, uh, in which the Pope was present and they had one of these uh, uh, disputations. But it's very different than the Rambans. The Jews were not given the right to speak, uh, or at least not what they wanted to say. And you know, all these things were thrown at them. And it was in a stadium, and the whole place is surrounded by screaming Catholic mob, and the Pope is there. You get it? And all this kind of stuff. I mean, that is, so the bottom line is the Jews lost the debate. Okay? Now, of course, in the Jewish books, they say we didn't lose it. But if you read even the Jewish version of it, uh, you know, it was their Albo, the Sefer Ikrim, and people like that. The, 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 it's, it's very sad to compare and contrast the um, debate of the Ramban on the one hand and the disputation on Tortosa on the other. Okay? So uh, a lot of Jews say, like this, this is the best we can do? The Jewish religion stinks. You see? And the result is, between one blow and another and another, these huge numbers of Jews convert. Okay? And this pope follows it up with the papal bull of 1414. Let's go to the next one. Where, uh, it, 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 let's, go to the, let's go to the next one. Yeah, here you go. Read the papal bull of 1414. And you'll see. They uh, ossered all the Gemaras. They burned all this for him. They tried to, uh, you know, close down all the Jewish stuff. Uh, as, a, as a punishment for losing the, the, the disputation of Tortosa. So it's really rough being Jewish. Okay? May I and Yavu Ezri. I mean, you know, it was like really rough being Jewish. And so as I said before, when we say that half the Jews in Spain converted, we mean over the course of these 30 years or so, a little less than 30 years. Uh, meanwhile, the king of Castile was growing up. He was one year old when he became king. Like Yoash, the king of Yehuda, as I say, <clears throat> as I mentioned the other day, it's not fun, you know, to to to, to be one year old and have a million dollars and not have a trust fund, okay? Because every vulture is going to swoop in on you. And so here you had a kid who's growing up, and everyone's trying to take advantage of him, especially the ruthless nobles, you know. Stay on our side and give us all the land. They stay on your side. You, you take all the land and, and get things out of him. Uh, the nobles in Spain were a rough lot, very rough. And the kids pulled back and forth. And so you can't grow up being normal. You get it? You cannot grow up being normal. Uh, and his mother, you know, Catalina the Fetzer, she's, she, she's doing her thing. And he, so his own, they had a regency, as they said before. And here's the kid growing up in these tumultuous times. By 1419, the kid is 13 years old, and he said, I want to be king now. Right? Enough of this. And he did assume power as King John II at the age of 13. His uncle, <clears throat> Ferdinand, had been the regent, but then he left to take over as King of Aragon. You, you, can you follow all this? Okay. But Ferdinand's sons remained behind, and they tried to control the kid. So you have, as I told you before, why do people waste their time with fiction? <laughs> you understand? History is more interesting. Uh, at this point, now here comes the real mini-series and the point of our talk tonight. At this point, a young nobleman at the court makes his move. This young nobleman, when, when he was, uh, he was born in 1390, so he's uh, 15 years older than the king. Right? Uh, as a, as a page at court, you know, he had befriended the young Yoash, shall we put it that way? And so let's put it this way. He was clever enough and smart enough to actually be nice to the kid. You get it? While everybody's just ruthlessly pulling him right and left, this guy, thinking ahead, was actually nice to him, okay? And therefore they became very good friends and although he was politically ambitious and manipulative, he was better to this young king than anyone else, and the two became inseparable. He was his only friend, okay? He was his only friend. So I'll tell you again, is this a miniseries or not, okay? To make a long story short, because it's a long story, very interesting, this is Alvaro de Luna, a very famous name from the 15th century. Alvaro became the ruler for the, almost the entire reign of King John II. So when the kid gets to a certain age, he basically puts this guy in charge. And for the next 30 years, the king, who is, as you will understand, a weak character, uh, indolent, 
into dancing and hunting thing and not affairs of state. I mean, he wasn't educated. The, the big problem with monarchy is these rulers never go to college, as we would say today. It's not like they got, you know, real education. Rarely in history do you find someone where the father will ram down an education because you're going to be king one day. I mean, it's Prince Charles, such an educated person. Now, he's been around, you know, but you get what I'm saying. He has a real education. I mean, I'm thinking of Frederick the Great or somebody like that who had a real education. Most of these people, especially if they become kings or emperors at young ages or empresses, you know, they have to have advisors and counselors in order to help them run the show. Where are they going to learn? You follow? This is why Plato famously advocates for republic. Remember that? Mm -hmm. And who runs the republic? Oh, you have to have 30 years experience, five years in the army, five years in government, five years in business, five years in this. You know, now, life doesn't work that way. You, know, you understand? I understand it. Just look at who we elect as presidents. But on the other hand, uh, you need some kind of education. Now, here's this King John. I mean, he's not going to the University of Salamanca or anything like that. And the truth of the matter is, losing a father when he's a baby and having a mother like that, and she dies in 1418, by the way, okay? And having these uncles and cousins who are constantly trying to manipulate him, what's the number one problem that Shlomo Amel in, the, uh, in Kohelis complains about? I got no friends. You can't have friends. If you're rich, you have no friends except those who you were friends with before you got rich, right? You win the, let's say you win the Powerball lottery tomorrow. You got a lot of friends, you don't have any friends, except who you knew before. Isn't that right? You see, it's not possible for people to be friends. So here you have a king growing up, he's gonna be here for 50 years, so who's your friend? So this guy, Alvaro de Luna, was his friend, and, and used that to become the power behind the throne and like the prime minister, whatever the, the constable, whatever the titles were. And uh, I'll say it again, the two became inseparable. Now, that means that you're talking about 30 years of endless intrigues. Like I said before, it's not a miniseries. It's like 100 episodes. And I mean that, you know, between this one and this one and this one. It's, you know, I won't bore you with all the details. But he outsmarted them all for 30 years, a little more, until he didn't. When Alvaro now takes over the administration of the country, because the new king, who's what, 13, 14, says, you know, you run the show. Um, he's basically giving him carte blanche. Okay? Now, tell me what situation the country had been without anybody really in charge and it being looted right and left and you know, degraded by all kinds of private interests, as we would say today. It was in a mess and a half. Okay? It was a mess and a half. Uh, the finances especially. It required an Alexander Hamilton to clean up the mess and put the country in the black. I mean, that's, that's a required. Now, uh, you see here, the red and the black. That's my favorite story. It's Cardinal Spellman and Rabbi Belkin from YU. Remember him? And uh, around 1960, thereabouts, when during the Cold War, the Catholic Church wanted to do an ecumenical business, so they gave $5,000 to YU as a present, Catholic Charities. It was a brotherhood gesture. And they have this. Um, press conference, because it's a PR business. Nothing wrong with that, right? We have enough hate in the world as it is. And Cardinal Spellman, remember him? He says, listen, you know, uh, we're all brothers in God. Uh, it's a little different, but you know, I have a skull cap, the rabbi has a skull cap, doesn't matter what the cause is, red, it's black, it doesn't matter, you know? And Belkin said, like, the difference between us is as follows. You have a red skull cap, but you represent an operation that's in the black. Okay. <laughs> I'm the head of YU. He said, I have a black skull cap, but I represent an organization that's perpetually in the red. Okay. So keep this in mind. But we all know, let's go to the next one, that Alexander Hamilton's don't grow in trees. That someone cannot just fix them up, but organize an economy and, and balance the budget and put the country in a solid footing, you know, where do you find people like that? 
So, I mean, we're talking about having economic skills on a national scale, okay? Not just how to, you know, make a buck here or there. Alvaro de Luna knows one such person who happened, of course, to be a Jew, as a matter of fact, to be a from Jew, and that was Abraham Benvenisti, and that's our, our hero tonight, so to speak. This Benvenisti, you probably heard the name, is a long-standing family, still around today, with a long tradition of court Jews, with that special kind of financial literacy that was passed down in the families from generation to generation. When you had these kinds of elites, like Crescus and the others, I mean, you just pick this up at the breakfast table. You, you know what I mean? They didn't talk about the funnies, <laughs> right? They talk about what they talk about, loans and credit and politics and all this sort of thing. In other words, let's put it this way. These Jews had the kind of education a king needed. Correct? Uh, now, um, now, as we saw under the Nuremberg Laws of 1412, passed by the Cortes, Jews were not allowed to be in the IRS. That's what happened. That there was a, a longstanding um, pressure of the Cortes, of the cities, that um, Jews cannot be tax collectors. Okay, they, they found that abhorrent. And you have to give it to Christians. Uh, and that's what they did. So a ton of Jews lost their parnosa overnight because when they fired all these guys, let's say I was a court Jew. Well, I employ about 500 people or 600 people, right? Just like today, somebody in the nursing home when the, the real estate business and all the rest of it, they employ a lot of others. You get it? And all of a sudden, they lost their parnosa. Well, the Cortes were dominated by the cities and the burghers who were particularly anti-Semitic. But the good Jews that I'm talking about, the people with skills, when they were dismissed by the national government at the demand to the parliament, were snapped up by the local nobles who were not subject to these laws in their private domains. So the nobles, who are rough characters, by the way, and you know they're pretty tough to their peasantry and all the rest of it, actually were always good to the Jews because it's in their good pocketbook interest. I'll just tell you interestingly, all during the 1400s, uh, the nobles, generally speaking, were one group that actually always favorable towards the Jews. And in 1492, they were the nicest to them. They, they didn't want the decree of expulsion. <clears throat> and when Jews had to leave the noble estates, it's interesting, you know, these dukes and princes treat them better than they were treated in the cities. That's, that's just interesting, okay? Because you develop this relationship uh, you know, if you have a long-term human relationship, okay? Even though it's strictly a business relationship, it's never strictly a business relationship. If we know each other for years and this and the other, you can't help but develop some kind of a bond. It's, it's the human nature, okay? So um, one of the greatest of the nobles was Hurtado de Mendoza. Mendoza is one of the leading Castilian families. And this guy would be like a Rockefeller or something like that with all the estates, and he employs Abraham Benvenisti as his money guy, as his Jew. Hurtado de Mendoza is a political ally of Alvaro de Luna, the guy who became the prime minister, okay? The king's buddy. Alvaro de Luna brings Abraham Benvenisti to court, and he puts him to work in the royal government. In other words, I'm putting you in charge of the money to fix the Augean stables in the kingdom of Castile, and the heck with the Cortes, right? Because they've been ripping the whole country apart anyway, and everybody I told you before has been taking away from the royal prerogatives. This guy, Alvaro Luna, I'll tell you again, he was a politician, no, no question about it. He, 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 it's a very interesting relationship. He wasn't bad to the king, you get what I'm saying? He just realized, as everybody did, the king can't run the country, doesn't have what it takes. But he worked, um, faithfully to build up the royal power, to establish the royal prerogatives, to get back land that the king had, had taken away from him and things like that, and in general, to build up the central government, which is the first step towards creating a modern state. Because the power is diffused among all the nobles and the cities, all the rest of it, nobody's in charge, you see? So the development of the modern state goes like this. You have diffused power among many different groups. Eventually, it becomes something called a king or something like that. He gets all the power. 
the king is a dictator. Once the power is concentrated, then eventually you can develop into the democracy because that concentrated power goes to an elected parliament. You follow what I just said? Uh, that's what happened in England. Otherwise, you still have the nobles running around doing whatever they want to the people in the countryside. There has to be the concentration of power. There has to go through a period of dictatorship, absolutism as we call it. And then, if things develop the right way, it'll morph into some sort of democratic power. The democratic state is an all-powerful state. We kind of want that. Agreed? I don't want anybody to have power in this country except the U.S. government. Because I get to vote who should be the U.S. government. I don't want any, if I'm in France, I don't want anybody to have power except France, the, the government. Correct? Otherwise, you have all these militias and who knows what running around, and then you don't have a country, you have FKRIS. You see? So I think it was Hegel who said the state is, uh, is, is uh, the, the one uh, group that we all agree can kill you. Right? We all agree with that. That the government, in other words, I don't think anybody has the right to kill anybody. That's not true. The government, under certain circumstances, has the right to kill people. No one else does. Now, hopefully, after due process, and if the guy committed a murder, like this a synagogue in, in Pittsburgh, and you know, or you have some terrible person or something like that. And when I say kill you, or put you in jail, or, or do anything, I can't go and torture you. But the government can if the people elect such a system, you see? The problem, of course, is, as we know, down till today, that sometimes it can happen, they get the concentration of power, but then the forces of democracy are never strong enough to displace that and take over. You see? That requires a certain political maturity. And we, in the good old USA, were able to skip the dictator part, right? But I think many of here people know if George Washington would have wanted, he could have done the dictator thing. It's just not who he was. You know, they offered him, correct? The soldiers offered him, and later the country offered him. That's not what he chose to do. So we got lucky. But I'm just saying, this is, now put yourself in Spain in the 15th century. So here we go. Um, the finances of the country were in the toilet, and the economy was floundering. So Alvaro de Luna said like this, I don't care who he is, I want that Jew. Okay? Abraham Benvenisti, backed by Alvaro de Luna, reorganizes the taxation, restores the old system of a Jewish IRS. He spreads all over the country, hires all the Jews, and they start to fix the finances. Okay? Within a year or two, the budget is balanced, and before long, there was a surplus which was not frittered away. So there was somebody in charge, like we say today, a controller of, of, of the money, okay? Uh, now, mind you, the king is just doing his thing. <laughs> He's not really even aware of what I'm talking about. He doesn't have to. Alvaro does, okay? He does. Before long, Abraham Benisti is more than just an IRS guy. He becomes an advisor and a member of Alvaro de Luna's inner circle. Thanks to the substantial funds that he brings in, Alvaro de Luna is able to consolidate and solidify the royal authority along the lines that I just described to you, right? This, of course, threatens to turn Castile into a modern country with a strong central government. As I told you, that's a basic necessary step in becoming a modern country. Centralization, royal absolutism, and then you get the parliament and all the rest of it. In addition, so my point is, that Alvaro de Luna, because of his strange set of circumstances, who's somebody nobody's ever heard of, unless you're Spanish, he's very famous in Spanish history, uh, he was, first of all, from the noble class, so he wasn't from the Bissena Antisemitan, and second of all, the guy I'm talking about is too smart and pragmatic to indulge in racism. You get it? Like I said before, if this guy's an Alexander Hamilton, I don't care what he looks like. You see? Because we need someone. Look, could we use somebody today in the United States of America to fix our $31 trillion deficit? Mm -hmm. I don't care if he's polka dot. <laughs> you know, if he could do it or she can do it or if it can do it, got my vote. Right? You know, you know I'm saying? You, you, we don't have the luxury to worry about this side stuff. We got an unbelievable, terrible debt, as we all know, and it's going to sink everybody, and nobody has any idea what to do about it. Well, in those days, you had somebody who knew how to do it best. Alvaro de Luna says, I'm going to get him. 
In addition, as I said before, he was too smart, cold, logical politician to be anti-Semitic. Alvaro, by the way, appointed many Jews and conversos to high positions of the administration because his needs dictated meritocracy. Okay? So what am I talking about over here? A complete change in the atmosphere at the highest levels of the government after almost 30 years of junk. From 1391 to 1419, you know, to almost 1421, uh, it was hell. You had the pogroms, and then the Farrakhans, and then the Nuremberg Laws, and then the Dispatch de Torso, and you had the Bad Queen, and so on and so forth, up and up, and you know, and they, by the way, they also had blood libels and host desecration. Very base. It was really bad news. And all the time, thousands of Jews, here, there, 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 your brother, your cousin, your brother-in-law, this and the other, are converting and leaving the fold. And now all of a sudden, because of a strange set of circumstances, like I said, it was like a mini-series, the situation changed. The, there's actually a strong government. The people in charge are different, right? and the people in charge like the Jews. That may be a little bit too strong of a term, but compared to what was before, it's not too strong of a term. And all of a sudden, the Jews are back. Now, by the way, the public doesn't like it. The Cortez didn't like it and all the rest of it. And they're always saying he's a Jew lover and so on and so forth. This is the politics of Castile in the first half of the 1400s. There's a fat book like this, all about this. I mean, this fat from the father of Bibi Netanyahu. That's what he wrote about, you know what I'm saying? Origins of the Inquisition. It's very opinionated and all, but, uh, but, but, you know, uh, but nevertheless, he goes and all this stuff, Baruch Bicha HaKetano. Uh, so, again, um, the public wasn't going to take this lying down. I mean, we're dealing over here with the 15th century. It's not the 13th or 14th century when the Christian public tolerated court Jews at high levels under the earlier kings in Aragon and Castile. This is after the riots and after all the, the, the inflammatory rhetoric, okay? By this time, I mean, um, there was also something new in Iberia, and that is a large population of conversos. The guy were not sure how to treat them. According to Catholic law, they're just like anyone else. They're free and equal, whatever the consequences are. If someone converts and they take to it, you can't kick them out of the uh, country club. You can't tell them they can't sit next to you in church. You can't tell them to leave the restaurant. They can't tell them you can't run for office. They're just like anyone else. Okay, just like anyone else. On the other hand, as I said before, how did the guy say it? You can change your name from Moses, but you cannot change the noses. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> you know, these people are very Jewish-like, and they still talk with that Jewish talk, and they hang around each other a lot. And, you know, and they combine to do business deals, which mess the others up. So in other words, let's put it this way. You don't get any of the good stuff of them being Jewish, but you get all the bad stuff of them being Jewish. You follow? And this infuriated the Catholic population. Okay? This is, you know, the, the, the population. And so what happens is that there develops among the population and the church um, a racism which means, you know, we'll have a sign now in the restaurant, nobody's allowed in, unless they've been Catholic for four generations. You follow? And to tell you the truth, until recently, I mean, nowadays, in the 20th century, the Catholic Church turned 180 degrees in the 1960s. That is a fact. But until then, um, you should read the Catholic writings. Uh, it takes many generations to rid that Jewish blood and the bad stuff from you, the age of horror. And I mean, they really were into this kind of stuff that even if somebody converted, you still you know, were considered tainted and you know, that, that kind of business. Um, a liberal Catholic would be someone who says, I know you converted, but I still can treat you like another Catholic. You see, that would be liberal within the Catholic context in the old days. Not that I, if you're Jewish, you have any rights, but since you converted, as opposed to the regular Catholics, I guess, what do you want to have to do with him? He's a Jew. Now, he wasn't Jewish, but, you know, racialism. And they even developed what they call limpetia de sangre, purity of blood, which means how Jewish are you? One parent, two parents, grandparents. So it's not exactly Hitler, but it's the foreshadowing of Hitler. It's the first time in history, 15th century in Spain, where these kind of things uh, pop up. And, uh, you know, one of the effects it had 
if you're Jewish and you want to get ahead, is you have to be more Catholic than the Catholics. And therefore, you, you go against your fellow Jews. You get what I'm saying? You want, you want to tell on them, you want to go against them, which is why a lot of these Farrakhans were what we call Mishamadim, which are Jews who converted, including rabbis. I'll say it again. There were some Chasha Rabbanim, and they flipped, and then they wrote all kinds of tracts and books uh, ferociously against Judaism and the Talmud and all the rest of it. And my goodness. Okay? Now, in this environment, you won't be surprised that the conversos lived in, each, in their own neighborhoods. They socialized with each other. They rose to success through their converso networking. And all that could not help but make angry their fellow Gaisha Catholics. Okay? So, in other words, they just, they'll say, like, this is a Jewish trick. They converted to beat the system. Now, why don't you admit you forced them to convert? And people aren't like that, you know? They say, these guys convert insincerely, and it's all part of a Jewish stick to get into the country club or to get access to that job and drive the regular Catholics out of that job. You see? Because now the Jewish guy went into the leather business. Used to be we could kick him out, and he couldn't compete with the others, but now he's a Catholic and compete with the others. He drove the others to the wall, undersold them, and put them all out of business, and the Jews triumph again. This is the kind of language that was raging all through the period we're talking about over here, okay? It, uh, the fact that they were now rising in addition to that, and the new bureaucracy being created by Alvaro de Luna, who's creating a royal government with a real genuine central government with a bureaucracy and all the rest of it, and a lot of these people are conversos, okay? So, uh, in fact, even some were Jews. Um, Abraham Benvenisti, people like, was a from Jew. I mean, he worked phone every day, you see? It's infuriated the, uh, the real Goyim, and it was certainly fodder for all the Farrakhans that were running around. Now, let's leave the conversos for their own devices for a minute, and let's concentrate on the Jews in Castile, okay? Because this is, in my opinion, one of the most interesting parts of this court job. Uh, the rise to power of Alvaro and Abraham Benvenisti, as I told you before, spells the end of the three terrible decades in 1391. Okay, so you have terrible times, a respite, and then later on it got worse, and, and Ferdinand and Isabella they kicked the Jews out, introduced the Inquisition. So we're in the middle period. So now came a period, a respite, for a bleeding and battered Claudius Rho. The Nuremberg Laws were on the books, but now they were not enforced by the government, and they were disregarded, because that's who Alvaro de Luna was. Parnosa improved because of the new IRS bureaucracy created by Abraham Benvenisti. As I said before, if you're putting me in charge of the IRS, I mean, how many jobs is that? You need tax collectors all over the kingdom and at the custom houses, right? And at the tariff collection centers and the toll roads and who knows what. You're talking about thousands of jobs. And he employed, you know, uh, thousands of Jews. All of a sudden, people at Parnoso. By the way, he also employed conversos. Uh, I don't know the details. In my opinion, he probably employed conversos, hoping this would be the car of them. You understand? That's, that's most likely. But, but that's, that's what I think. Uh, Jews could now, under the new regime, engage in all kinds of economic activities. As I told you before, Alvaro de Luna basically liked the Jews. Uh, there's this... Great story in the Sheva Yehuda. I forgot to bring the book with me. Uh, the Sheva Yehuda is uh, one of the classics of Jewish historiography. It's one of the Frum history books, which you read on Tisha B'Av time, now in the nine days. So if anybody wants, you know, approved reading list from Mishnah you know, read the Sheva Yehuda. And he talks about all the troubles that Jews had in Spain and all this sort of thing and the sufferings they went under in 1492. But he also has a lot of other incidents from earlier times, and blood libels, and who knows what. There's a whole thing, I did it on a podcast, there's a whole thing where Avram Benbenisti is called in by Alfonso the king, and they say, they, they say uh, uh, a body is missing, and uh, somebody's testifying that the Jews you know, stole the body for the blood and all this kind of business, and Abraham Benbenisti comes in, and he says to Alfonso, uh, you know it's not true, and Alfonso the king said, I know it's not true because the Jews are, you know, or they don't do that sort of thing anyway. 
uh, you know, there's no money in it, <laughs> something like that. That's, that's what he says. And, but, you know, we, we, we got to go through the I don't remember exactly the story, but he said, you got to go through the motions. And uh, they bring in all, all, all the accusers. And meanwhile, Alfonso says, you know why people don't like you? Because you hang around each other, you help each other, you're clannish, and this and that and the other. And, you know, Abraham Vinisti says this and that. It's not Alfonso, the king. There was no King Alfonso in the, uh, in the, in the, in the 1400s. Uh, it's Alvaro de Luna. It's just, you know, the, the author got it a little mixed up from memory. And it fits him exactly. Because Alvaro de Luna is like, you know you Jews hang together. You know people don't like it for this, that, and the other. He's not doing anything wrong to him. And at the end of the story, the, in the book, uh, the king, quote, unquote, uh, makes investigation. And they call him the main accuser. Uh, and uh, I think they found a dead body with stab wounds in or something like this in the cemetery. And the king says, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get to the truth through a magic potion. What's the magic potion? Guilt. <laughs> That's what he says. The thing which is more powerful than kings. And he says, you know, whoever can give me real information about this will get money. Well, sure enough, all these neighbors of this uh, Barbara, I think it was, says he killed the guy and he dragged the body into the thing and he blamed him on the Jew and all the rest of it. And at the end is, you know, the, the perpetrator gets uh, killed. He gets buried up to here. You know, he knows he, he gets killed. So that's Alvaro de Luna. You get it? That wasn't the king, the king, of, uh, uh, king John of Castile. And certainly was no guy, uh, Alfonso. It gives you a flavor of the times. You get it? But here's this Abraham Benvenisti. He's got to play ball with him. But you see that they had a relationship. So... Um, that's what I mean when I say that he liked the Jews. The bottom line is um, that in this kind of a world, when he's constantly threatened by intrigues and wars and all the things, the world stands on three things, money, money, money. So that's, so, you know, and this guy is delivering him the money. I don't mean in a bad way. He's organized the, the finances. He's acting as a comptroller. He's making sure that more comes in than goes out. He's making sure there's a surplus. If you're Alvaro de Luna, you need a surplus for rainy day, for just in trouble, get it? And um, he's delivering the goods. Now, at the same time, toxic opposition exists. Repeated, repeatedly, there are attempts at coups and assassinations. Like I said before, if you went through all the politics of the 1420s, 1430s, and 1440s, and in the early 1450s, you see one plot after another after another. Um, but, uh, you know, but for 30 years, Team Alvaro beat the opponents. He's always stayed one step ahead of them. With the king reposing full confidence in his friend, and I told you, he was as good a friend as you're going to get. He wasn't out to hurt the king. Just the king was, you know, a weak character. A weak character, okay? Um, the king's wife, the first one, Marie, he had two wives. She hated Alvaro, and she's always trying to poison the king against him. And, you know... And there are all these close calls. And then she dies under mysterious circumstances. And then, you know, the neighbors say, Alvaro poisoned her or something like that. Who knows, you know? Okay, the second queen comes in, as we shall see. So still, the, everything I'm talking about is dancing on eggs or standing right next to a volcano because there were constant blood libels, charges of host desecration, as I told you before, things like that. And all Abraham Benvenisti can do is manage the situation. The story I gave you in the shape of you is an example of that. You know, he had to go to this town in this year to handle this blood libel. He had to go to this thing and then you know, get an attorney uh, like this. It's a little bit like Thurgood Marshall had to go in the South all the time to represent, you know, in the racist trials, you see? This is, this is part of being a court Jew. This is part of being a court Jew. It was an unstable situation. It only lasted as long as Alvaro de Luna. Meanwhile, hold that thought, and we turn to a very interesting parsha, We turn to Abram ben Benisti and his fellow Jews in Castile. Herein lies a tale of lasting significance in Jewish history. Okay? Our hero, Abram ben Benisti, was no Talmud Chacham. How would he be? He spent all of his life in the world of business. And if you deal with the nobles and king, it's a 24-hour business. Okay? I mean, Chazdei Kreskis is don't grow on trees. That's very rare. We talked about last time that somebody's a great talent. That's extremely unusual. 
However, on the other hand, Abraham Benveniste was a sincerely religious Jew. He was not like others of his stratum. You know, you read Fritz Baer's famous book, All the Richie Riches Are Rotten. And that was very, very often the case because the type of skills it takes you to claw your way to the top don't make you a nice person, Jewish or otherwise, okay? This guy was different, okay? He was what we would call today a from balabas in the best sense of that term, all right? He was a Jewish... Uh, he was a Jewish statesman, even, with a large vision, because he was, you know, in charge of the whole kingdom, and he discerned, already from the beginning, the disastrous effects of the thirty bad years from 1391 to 1421, um, and he understood that the only way to rebuild, not simply economically and emotionally, but Jewishly, the only way you could possibly rebuild is through chinuch. So here we have a story that parallels what happened after 1945. That's where you invest. So whatever money the Jewish community is going to raise is not going to go into big synagogues, it's not going to do anything like that, it's going to go into education at the elementary school level, at the high school level, at the beyond. The yeshivas in Spain have been destroyed in 1391, those years. So that simply means new ones have to be restarted. So you have a Sisyphus operation, which... You know, you had to roll the, the, the stone up, and if it rolls down, you got no choice but to roll it back up. Like the Panovich Rav, you know? Everything got destroyed, everybody got killed. What do I do now? You can sit and say boo-hoo, or you can say, we simply have to start rolling the, 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 the stone back up. What else can you do? What else is there to do? Okay? And so, um, in our case, Abraham Benministi uh, teamed up with a uh, young and dynamic uh, Rosh Hashiva type. Uh, from a modern Orthodox family, whose father had been a mathematician and a poet. So today you say, I guess, you know, uh, he's from Columbia <laughs> University, you know? but his kid's going to be uh, in Lakewood or something like that. His name was Isaac, Isaac Campantone. Yeah, he, he maybe maybe heard of him, probably never heard of him. They call him Hagaon Castilia for this reason. And our hero, Abraham Benminis, he said like this, this guy can be the next Aaron Cutler. And so I'm going to bankroll him. And, uh, and he does. And as a result, he basically um, built the town where he lived, Zamora. Okay? You can go there today. It's a beautiful town in north, Santa, like the belly button more or less, a little higher in Spain. Totally Gaisha country. But it was in Zamora and it had a Jewish community at that time. And he said, you know, I'm going to back you financially, because he's a millionaire, and uh, do your thing. And he establishes a yeshiva in um, Zamora, and uh, he's a master teacher, and he inspires his students, and he inspires them to want to start their own yeshivas. So this is a process that takes 20 years. Okay, it doesn't happen overnight. He, 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 he had secular education, I'll tell you again. came from a modern Orthodox family. His father was a fairly well-known mathematician and poet. Okay, I mean, all Orthodox Jews. And he uses his secular education to create a type of brisker lumdus of the 14th, uh, 15th century, which captures the imagination and makes learning and the whole yeshiva world hot. And that's the famous book that you never heard of called uh, Darche HaGemara, right? which is a manual of pilpul. Okay, it's an extraordinary work. Uh, and, what, and it's what we call iyun, uh, and it's a certain type. No, it's not the, this, the type of lambdas I'm talking about is out of fashion today. But it was wild for a couple hundred years. Just like brisk one day is going to be out of fashion. You know, they say everything has a history. But if you talk about brisk or shimon shkup today, it's like very hot, uh, exciting. So this was exciting by the standards of the late Middle Ages. He used formal logic of the late medieval type combined with Talmudic studies combined with a very from attitude. And he says, when you learn a Gemara, you have to do it this way and this way, and these are the kind of questions you ask, and this is how you review it, and so on and so forth. And um, it's around. They've actually just reprinted it with the kudos. You, you, can, you can buy it today, okay? And uh, yes, well, I mean, you want to be scholarly about it? You know, more or less, yeah, more or less. Uh, and it, all I can say is it took off like wildfire, and what matters is subjective more than objective. If the guys found it hot, 
That's what counts more than anything else. Okay? And he inspires in the aftermath. Well, this happened in our time after 1945. Am I right or am I wrong? All these sheep, everything was destroyed in Europe, as we all know. And then they rebuilt it with some kind of a enthusiasm. How many people in Lakewood today? I think like seven, 8,000, you see? And, and, and Punavish and all these other places, they're doing something to excite the people, okay? They're doing something. They're not simply saying, we're reading old books, you see? It's, you you, you got to turn to something. So Abraham Benvenisti was smart enough to be a talent scout and find the right guy. And he said, this is the guy to do it. Um, the, the yeshiva building, by the way, the yeshiva building is still there, uh, page 31. For what it's worth, if you, next time you go to Spain, if you go to Zamora, which is one of the beautiful cities in Spain, I know it's not so well known, but it's not unknown either. There you go. Here's a uh, body shop, you know, a car, <laughs> a car body shop, chop shop. And uh, that's the yeshiva building of once upon a time. Okay, from the old Huderia, from the old Jewish uh, community. So next time we go to Spain, if, we, uh, if you want to take the, the Lakewood special, so to speak, you know, say so you go to Zamora, and they show it to you. By the way, they want to build it up for tourism. So they even have something called Centro Isaac Campanton. Go look it up online. The Isaac Campanton Centro, Central, you know, to bring the tourists. They have, of course, no idea who the heck he is, but he was some Jewish rabbi, you know, who was hot stuff, and he was. Okay, and I, I, I want to make a point. Um, his students were inspired by him, and they opened the whole network of yeshivas, like we have in America. So look at this map. All these places you see over here are the network of Lakewood yeshivas, so, if I can use that term. And one's in Salamanca, which was uh, the leading university. It's like Harvard. You get it? Uh, Medina del Campo, Guadalajara, the Spanish one, of course. And all these other places. And, and they're not in the places where they had been before, in Cordoba and Seville. And, you know, it's, a, it's a new operation. And they're in the super Geisha areas. I mean, the, the, these, these places are like the heart of, heart of Spain. So um, these are the communities that have not been wiped out. You see? Uh, there were still small Jewish communities over there. The Jewish communities are in their own ghettos, what they call Huderia. And... Uh, you know, uh, under the Nuremberg laws, he couldn't build big, big, fancy synagogues. He didn't even want to challenge that. He said, why am I wasting my time building a fancy shul? You know, we don't have the money for that. You get it? If we have any money, we're putting it into this. We're putting it into this. We're putting it into people. You follow? And there's a whole galaxy of these students in the 1400s that each one of them, you know, starts his own yeshiva wherever it is in Spain. In the teeth of all the anti-Semitism, in the teeth of what's going to soon be the Inquisition, in the teeth of all the you know, toxic environment that he had all over the country, and the guy don't even know this is happening, I'm sure, and all of a sudden, the Jewish community started having shiurim and you know, program, learning programs and things like this. Zamora was one intense place. The literary monument of Zamora... Uh, because he didn't write anything. He only wrote this book, this manual. Uh, the literary mind of Zamora is the Akedis Yitzhak, the famous Sefer. He was the rabbi in Zamora, the Darshan. Okay? So those who know I'm talking about, one of the big uh, books, five volumes, uh, called Akedis Yitzhak, that's the name of the Sefer from Yitzhak Arama in the 1400s. A very hard Sefer and very philosophical in a certain style. It's not an easy read but it's very intense. And i tell you the truth, I used to think when I was young that he had a rich congregation, all the rest of the time, that's not what it was. He was in Zamora, and that was an intense area, although if you walked around the regular streets, you might not know them unless you went to the, Jew you went to the Jewish community. Uh, there's a very nice book that just came out uh, by a big scholar in Israel, Zivel, which is a whole fat um, biography of the Balakeda, right, it's a, a aroma. This will be so I'm talking about a Jewish revival, okay? And I'm talking about a Talmudic revival, as it were. And I'm talking about, therefore, a religious revival emerging out of that, which is the only solid basis. And this is the world, for example, that their Barbanel is going to come out of, and others. Because otherwise, how could there be anything Yiddishkeit-wise when everything was killed and destroyed in the 1391 period? 
The answer is that this guy, you know, um, I don't think he tells it to Alfred Delunio. I don't think Alfred Delunio gives it to Dorn. But, uh, but it, he made it happen, okay? And I'll say again, his slogan was, all the f significant money goes for education. That's the famous thing. Shoals can be small. You don't need a building. You can have a base medicine and so on and so forth. But the, the money goes for the teachers and all the rest of it. Now, mind you, not everybody in Spain was yeshivish in the 1400s. You had plenty of bums and all the types. But you had this group. One very important element was this group and was created by this post-1391 joint effort of the court Jew and the Rosh Hashiva, of, of uh, Abraham ben Benisti and Isaac Kampantan. It's like an Ezra Nehemia type situation. One guy handled the spiritual side, one guy handled the material side, okay? And so you see that this guy, who you never heard of, Abraham ben Benisti, was not simply a machzik Torah, somebody who supports schools. He was really what they call making mulashal Torah, which means he reestablished the whole system, okay? Now, I can't tell you um, how, what, what a powerful impact this is down until today. Why? Because what it means is that in the 1400s, in the wake of all the pogroms and all the other junk, when at least half the population and more converted to Christianity, uh, there was an intellectual revival within Sfarad. And as a result, by 1492, when they all had to leave, these yeshivas left, and the Sephardim go and conquer the world. Look at this map over here, uh, the next map of the Turkey. Yeah, that's the Ottoman Empire. The Sephardim move all over the place, and they take it over, they imperialize it. You know and I know Sephardim come from Spain. They're not in Turkey, in the Balkans, in the Middle East, in Israel, in Egypt, North Africa, and those kind of places. They're in Sephardim. Well, guess what? After 1492, they're not, and therefore the, the religious ones. Therefore, they end up in this map that you see over here, in all these territories, in Greece and in the Bulgaria and Yugoslavia and Turkey and the, you know, the Middle East and North Africa and so on and so forth. And when they come to these places after 1492, the locals are not Sephardim. They got their own ways. In Egypt, there's a minig of Mitzrayim, as you know. In Syria, there's a minig of Syria. They have the Syrian way of doing things. In the Balkans and in Turkey, it's what they call Romaniot, correct? Not Romania, but Romaniot. And these are old, long-standing prestigious Jewish traditions. The Sephardim come in and they nuke them, okay? It takes 100 years of fights, and they basically walk in and say, okay, guys, we're the Sephardim, we're taking over, right? The best example that comes to mind is when the Sephardim moved to Egypt, when the time of the Radbaz in Egypt, Egypt had its own way, and they didn't have a silent monastery, like conservative Judaism, okay? Because Maimonides, when he was in Egypt, he reformed the service because there's too much talking in Shul. It's very famous, right? So he abolished the Salish Monastery. Maimonides, okay? That was back in the 1100s. Okay, I mean, he could do it. He was the Roche Basin, you know? It's, it's what we call a necessary reform. Unfortunately, at that time, unlike today, there was talking in Shul. <laughs> uh, comes, comes the Svartim in the, in the early 1500s, and the what the heck is this? Well, the Rambam said it. I don't believe it, because the Ram was Sephardi. They showed him the stuff, and they said, well, I'll be son of a gun. The Ram Mom said it, but we're bringing back the old way. Okay? We're normalizing here, because this is crazy. And you don't need me to mention, you know, all the galaxy of Sephardic greats of the 1500s, which just dominate the Jewish scene. It's Joseph Caro, and, uh, you know, the Radvas, and uh, the Marsh Dam, and the Marin Leib, and... Uh, uh, just a host of names, Mari Bey Rav, and Mar Mahashkar, and Rav Bach, and then one after another, after another, after another, are very great. Where did these guys come from? I thought Spain was all busted. You understand? Like, where did they come from? And how come they took over? This is the answer. Because between 1420 and 1492, as a separate business, an entire intellectual revival focused on the Talmud and, and, and Jewish religion was taking place, sub Rosa maybe, perhaps, you know, they had their own network. If you were Jewish, you knew about that map of all the different yeshivas. Doesn't matter where they're in. Listen, in America, you have yeshivas in crazy places. You know, New Jersey and Pennsylvania, you know, who knows what, in Patterson, or whatever, you know, in, in, in Akron, Ohio, you know. It doesn't matter. But on the Jewish map, you know where they are. And so what I'm trying to say is that uh, this Abraham M. Venisti, he's responsible for Avadi Yosef. You get it? 
In other words, today, today, in the year 2023, there are basically two types of Judaism out there. Not literally, but 99%. It's Ashkenaz and Sephard. What happened to all the others? There's nothing wrong with them. They're as legitimate as anyone else. So where's your Italian stuff, you know? Where's your Romania stuff? It's, it's almost extinct. It's radically marginalized. How come is the Ashkenaz and the Sephard? Well, this is the reason why it's the Sephard. Okay? This is the reason why it's the Sephard. Okay? Now, um, and all this, again, in the toxic environment of 15th century Castile. Abraham Benveniste's very correct focus on Chinuch was reflected in the famous Takonis of Valladolid in the 1430s. The city of Valladolid, which, again, is in northern Spain, was the royal capital site, and um, he called a convention of tax collectors to discuss the royal finances, and he said, while we're here, let's talk about the Jewish situation, and the hour's late, so I don't have the time to go into this in great detail, but, uh, and it was all written in Spanish. Nobody knew about it until like 150 years ago they discovered this uh, in the Spanish records, uh, that he said like this, listen, the Cahillas have been busted by the, by the pogroms, all the rest of it, a lot of corruption and misrule has entered into Jewish uh, communal life. The federations think all the rest of it. We have to reform the business from top to bottom. Okay? And, uh, and they listened to him because he was the boss. He was the guy who's tight with the government. Okay? And so, uh, because uh, don't, you'll be surprised to hear that the king, which means Alvaro, had named him Rabbi de la Corte, the, rabbi, the, rabbi de la Corte, the chief rabbi of the Jews. Okay? Well, in this case, now, he's not a chief rabbi with the sense, but on the other hand, he's the right guy for the job because he was a good guy, okay? And everybody knew this, and he used his powers to gather the leaders of all the killers, and they have extensive uh, constitution for the communities of Spain. They reformed the elections, they reformed the administration, they reformed the basins, the judicial procedure, the dual, due process, they reformed Jewish education, all the quarrels and questions that can't be solved locally or between killers, are referred to him, okay? So in other words, because he's the right guy to do it. Uh, so the picture that emerges of Abraham Benveniste as a court Jew and um, is a remarkable one externally and internally, okay? In other words, Klape Chutz, he plays this important role in Spain, and that helps the Jews. It also helps Spain, by the way, from a certain point of view, if you care about the finances and the economy of the government. Uh, but look what he did internally. Now, fortunately, as I said before, Alvaro de Luna was able to hold out for three decades, and he built a bureaucratic machine. But it got out of hand. In 1449, he tries to impose a tax on Toledo. The whole city rides against the conversos. There's a civil war that rages in the street, a civil war between the conversos on the one hand and the regular government on the other. Obviously, they overwhelmed the conversos. It got really crazy over there. And in the end, uh, it, it started to take him down, and the second wife took him down. So as you see over here, read this. You'll see that the first queen died in mysterious circumstances, but the second queen was able, I can't look over and read it, but you'll see Isabella of Portugal was the second queen, and although the, her marriage was because of Alvaro de Luna, she was offended by the immense influence of the constable of Alvaro and the murder of the king's accountant, was suspected to be under his orders. She urged her husband to free himself from thrall into his favorite. So she poisoned the mind of King John against him, and, he, and, and it got him to chop his head off. That's a famous painting of chopping the head off, if you see, right? Of, uh, the fall of the mighty Alvaro de Luna. As soon as it was over, the king felt bad and depressed, and he died within a year, okay? Because he realized that he had been manipulated by the other side. So why did he give him in the first place? That's the kind of weak character that he was. <clears throat> now, I've got to tell you something. Um, just for the heck of it, since I'm doing 15th century, so I went looking yesterday online, uh, you know, the Spanish made a whole miniseries on Queen Isabella that would be the, the daughter of John and this woman, okay? And she, l let's put it this way, she shot herself in the foot because... Once her husband died, she was ice queen. You understand? And then the son took over, and he didn't like her I mean, from the other from the other wife. And you know, she put, and she was worried about it for the rest of her life, and so forth. Now, this is very well known in Spain. It's not known elsewhere. 
Well, I, this was too good to be true to, to pass this up. You have a scene over here where Isabella of Portugal, the queen who got him killed, this is years later, 20 years later, and she realized what a mistake she made, and she uh, got obsessed over her messing things up and having betrayed this guy. And, you know, she had nightmares all the time, all the rest of it. And here, let's go look at this. Yeah, I just have the, the, the thing. She's at, ba begging this guy uh, to help her children who are now in trouble. And she says, I can't tomorrow. And she says, you've been always good to me. You know, even though I killed your boss, Alvaro de Luna, okay? You educated my children as if they were yours. No, he didn't take revenge. And he says, you didn't sign the death sentence. And she says, yes, I did, right? I got the king to sign it, <laughs> right? I got the king. It's Spanish. It's in Spanish. I'm so sorry. And that's why she says, God is punishing me, <laughs> okay? You know, and I see the ghost of Don Alvaro that comes to visit me all the time and to remind me of my sins. <laughs> okay? So, I mean, this is part of the Spanish history. You get it? Ordinarily, who cares? Wasn't good for the Jews. Thanks a lot, lady. You understand? Wasn't good for the Jews. Because when he went down, the good time is over. You get it? When he went down, the good time is over. We don't know what exactly happened to Abraham. We don't hear him. Maybe he predeceased him, you know, possibly. Uh, if not, he certainly didn't remain in office after the fall of his patron. And 40 years later came 1492. See? Uh, Alvaro was killed in 15, 1454. So it's actually, uh, you know, 38 years later. So how do we sum this up? We look at a different type tonight. He's not Chazde Kreskes, and he's not Shmuel Hanugid. He's not the Chazdeh ben Shapru type. He's certainly not the sordid business we have with that guy, Pichon, and all the rest of it. It's a, everyone is different and unique. He certainly leaves a legacy as a court Jew, but his legacy as a court Jew, in terms of external influence, is episodic. He came and he went. He's a little detail in Spanish history, okay? Maybe a little, bitter, a, a little bit bigger of a detail in Jewish history, a little bit. His patronage of learning, though, still lives. You see? That's his permanent legacy today. And that's why we all remember, let's go to the next one. What's the difference between a permanent legacy? We all know one of the martyrs in Tisho Time says, the osius prochus gvila nifzer mebeish, that, uh, which, which, you know the story with Hanim and Trajan when they burned the Torah around them, all the rest of it. So that's a story that happened, but what's the meaning of it? There's the permanent and the transitory. The gvilin, nisr vesh, the physical Torah stuff. Now, there, there are parts you do in your life which just disappear and don't matter. Your long-term legacy, no one can take from you. Okay? Good night.